welcome to uh, the panel, which is called Towards a More Resilient Europe, Assessing Risks, Opportunities and Capabilities. Um, we have a uniquely stellar uh, panel with us uh, uh, today, coming from a range of institutional settings. Um, and its aim is to go deeper into the practice of resilience in Europe, explore how we can operationalize the concept of resilience, so that it's not just an element of the narrative, but actually a guiding principle um, for EU policies. The Commission, in its first annual FOSA report, proposes that resilience should be a new compass for EU policies. And I will want to ask the panelists what that means in the theatres of operation, how precise and detailed this compass should be, and whether its indications in the different fields can be made to rhyme together. It is important to spend just a minute on the very concept of resilience. It emerged after the economic and financial crisis over 10 years ago, and also in the context of the ever more intense uh, risk landscape uh, internationally. Um, but it's, it is really the necessity for climate action and the pandemic that really propels resilience to its proposition uh, today. One of the early proponents of the use of the term, Professor Enrico Giovannini, rightly recalls that re resilience is originally derived from material science, where it means the ability of a material to absorb energy when it suffers a shock and then release that energy upon unloading. I think that's a very useful uh, parallel for us to consider. Uh, it's useful because it puts emphasis both on the ability to withstand and cope with the challenges, but then also to recover in a sustainable fashion. And both sides of this coin are equally uh, important, although they are not exactly uh, the same. So this is the first issue about resilience. It is about anticipation and preparedness, and, and then it's about conditions for renewal. The second challenge has to do with the fact that, um, resilient, that the resilience chain is only as strong as its individual uh, links. And this means that the transformation has to be of systemic nature with no significant gaps left. It only really works as a matrix. The Commission's report speaks uh, of four arcs of resilience, socioeconomic, geopolitical, green and digital. And it means that resilience really has to be horizontally integrated across the boards to make a difference. And thirdly and lastly, there is also a democratic dimension to resilience, uh, given that it does require substantial investment. It requires the reallocation of resources, um, and uh, it's by no means a free lunch. And therefore, it has to make its way into the democratic discourse. I'm delighted to welcome our speakers today, starting by Klaus Welle, followed by Mikhail Dovgilevich, Pascal Lardini, and Benedetta Berti. Uh, I will introduce them in, in turn. Uh, before we start, I would like to encourage you to send questions to panelists. And you can do that uh, by sending them to the presenter via the WebEx chat. If you need any technical advice, you can certainly write to the host and your questions will be answered. So the stage will be set for us by uh, Klaus Weller, who's, who has had not only a distinguished career as Secretary General of the European Parliament, but is also a refined analyst of the uh, European um, landscape. Um, and I'm turning now to Klaus for his take on the place of resilience in the European system of governance. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pavel, for this very kind um, introduction. Uh, in fact, uh, the European Union has been confronted over the last 12 years with three major crises. Uh, the financial crisis, the immigration crisis, and also COVID. And in all, in all those situations, we had the impression that uh, we were not perfectly prepared, let's put it like this. To be honest, on COVID, the reaction was the quickest, even though health is not uh, normally the responsibility of the European Union, but rather in the remit of the member states or even parts of the member states. Immigration was quite painful and the financial crisis brought many of the member states uh, to really existential situations. So I think the question is justified. Um, couldn't we prepare better for the next crises coming up, which we maybe do not know now, 
but we know that they will be there. And if so, uh, can there be a kind of methodology on how we can screen the landscape and prepare the European Union better? So to do it in a systematic way and not in an ad hoc way. Anthony has made reference to a number of studies which have been conducted in the in our parliamentary research service, which had exactly this purpose. Um, what we've tried first is, together with all the colleagues and the experts across policy fields, to map the structural risks facing the European Union. Uh, maybe we could show that uh, graph for participants. Um, we've done it the following way. Uh, we've assembled the risk and then I've tried to put them into a space dependent on whether they are more likely or less likely and whether they have just sectorial effect or rather generalized effect. Of course, if the effect of a potential risk happening is uh, only sectorial and if that event is less likely, that probably needs for the moment less attention. On the other hand, you have the red quadrant, which brings together the risks which are more likely and even some very, very likely, and which are also likely to create a generalized effect. And in the next slide, you can see uh, just this part of the quadrant in bigger. Maybe we can move to the next, to the next one. Yes. So um, that's what our experts in the research service were coming up. Of course, this can always be debated. But you see in the upper right, um, in let's say COVID and its immediate consequences, so health consequences, poverty, uh, difficulties for social protection systems to cope. But it also allows, and that it's becoming maybe more interesting, to immediately have a look at the crisis waiting after the crisis, and that's the area in dark blue. And the area in dark blue, which is still generalized effect, but a little bit less likely because it's not yet there, basically is dealing with a lot of issues to which have to do with debt. Um, why is debt the consequence of COVID? Because A, the deficits of many member states have increased because of special COVID programs. Secondly, the reference figure of the overall debt, which is the GDP, is shrinking. So you have a double effect. On the one hand, the deficits are increasing, but the, but the overall GDP is shrinking at the same time. And thirdly, most member states, because of the economic crisis, have to prepare for less taxes coming on. That means you have a triple effect uh, on the debt sustainability uh, of the system. And therefore, uh, we have come to the conclusion that this is the issue or the crisis waiting after the crisis. So that means that the German debt position probably will move into the direction of the French debt position before the crisis the French debt position will move towards the Italian debt position before the crisis and so on. Um, the third, in the third round then, you have the political consequences because if debt is being increased, there's a moment where that issue needs to be addressed and that can easily lead to tensions, uh, to difficulties in the social security network as we have also seen during the financial crisis. And because of this linkage of the imminent crisis, the crisis in the waiting, and the crisis behind that, of course, there was so much political will to activate the 750 billion additional package and therefore to deal with it also on the European level. If we go to the next step, then of course we have to look at what are our capabilities to deal with this. And we've concluded that basically we have two sets of tools. The one set of tools is regulatory and the other set of tools in the European Union is financial. So in the green area, you have all the policies where we have 
substantial regulatory tools and substantial financial means. So that's why it's green. In the yellow boxes, you have policies which are maybe very well financed, but don't have a lot of regulatory tools. Or on the other hand, policies where you have strong regulatory tools, but not backed up by a lot of financing. And then you have the red quadrant to focus our mind, where we neither have the regulatory tools nor the financial means. And therefore, it's the red quadrant which probably will need most of attention. This, of course, is a look at the EU system rather on the federal level. So if we take one step further and go to the next slide, uh, we are introducing here an image which is maybe better adapted. And our research service has done this work for, I think if I remember correctly, about 35 different policy areas. Because in reality, what's defining the capacities of the union is not just what is available on the federal level, so the EU institutions, but also what is available in the member states, uh, inter-governmentally, uh, inter or through just cooperation. So again here, we've been working green, yellow, red, trying to analyze uh, which tools are fully available, so they're in green, where there's something but not sufficiently developed, so that's yellow, and where there should be something, or is maybe under debate, but it's really not there yet. So we are suggesting an approach which is not just looking at the capabilities on the federal system of the union, which is the Brussels institution system, but at the overall system, because if sufficient capabilities are there in the member states or through intergovernmental cooperation, that's already getting us some way, maybe not the whole way, but some way, but this has to be systematically taken into account. If we take that approach one step further, and if we say these are really generalized risks, which are very likely, and we don't have the capacities in the union for the moment, then we are also getting very close to policy planning here. Because if these are major risks with potential generalized impact, then we have to do something about it. So if we don't have enough capabilities for the moment, and it's yellow or red, this is something that the political process should be, uh, should be attacking. And that's why I believe the decision of the new commission to provide Commissioner Marosevkovic with the competence, not only on annual programming, but on multi-annual programming, which could take a look, could take a look on those issues. At the, si at the same time, give him responsibility for the joint research council with about 300 experts and for inter-institutional relations is really providing the union for a first last chance, maybe the first time, uh, to start to take this seriously and have a systematic approach on risk, uh, risk avoidance, policy planning and going through to actual realization. Thank you very much. Klaus, no, thank you very much for taking us uh, through uh, this sophisticated uh, landscape of instruments which needs to be put together in order for, for the Union to have a credible uh, response to the risks uh, we are facing. I mean, you showed us um, how so many elements have to come together at the institutional level, but also uh, in the member states. Uh, um, I remember that uh, a couple of years ago, you launched the concept of a complementary executive capacity of the union to complement the action of the of the member states. Uh, and I'm curious whether you would see also uh, the role for such a capacity to address issues that have to do with uh, with resilience. Um, but I'm sure we can discuss it during the panel. Let me let me now turn. Thank you so much, uh, Klaus. And let me now uh, introduce and turn to uh, Mikhail Dovgilevich, who is uh, Director General at the European Investment Bank and the permanent representative to uh, the European institutions, uh, with a question uh, with, regarding the role of resilience in uh, in the bank's uh, policies. So, um, when you look at what the bank does uh, from supporting the SMEs on to dealing with the, the climate uh, emergency, 
uh, one could think that uh, quite a lot of that has to do with resilience. So is resilience a helpful concept in, in guiding uh, the decisions that the, the bank uh, needs to uh, take? Over to Mikoe. Yes, thank you very much, Pavel. I, I think, uh, well, let me first of all uh, thank uh, ESPAS for this invitation uh, for, to the EIB and to myself. This is really great to be in this uh, EU family to discuss concepts which are so vital for the uh, for the union in the future. Um, I think indeed the concept of resilience is absolutely key in the current con uh, in the current uh, context or environment. I would uh, like to share with you uh, a number of thoughts uh, which are centered around four points actually. But uh, I would first say, of course, uh, Klaus mentioned this: uh, the unprecedented nature of the current crisis. Um, is uh, is absolutely exceptional and of course there are many risks ahead i mean uh, there is a lot of catching up that uh, will have to be done not just because of covid but also because of structural deficiencies of our european economy that were very much uh, visible before the crisis there's also something which should not be forgotten despite the different transfer mechanisms that we are uh, hopefully going to finalize in the coming weeks in the union there's still a big danger of having many losers and many well winners and losers within the european union and when I, when I say this i mean both in terms of regions member states and also corporate uh, sector so i think it is the question of economic and social convergence would be a very very big and difficult issue i think in the coming decade uh, or so i think what um, what i would say is why eib is also central to concept of building up the eu resilience is that it, it, it can it can act as a catalyst as a kind of uh, um, as a kind of uh, a beacon uh, for investors not to be for private investment uh, to attract it to different projects uh, that would deliver public goods and i think this is uh, this is very much uh, obvious in the times when no national budget no or no a public money envelope can be sufficient to do, to fulfill different uh, policy uh, objectives. I mentioned four points. My first point is related to climate policy and uh, and resilience in this context. Uh, you know that the EIB has taken a decision to become a climate bank, and this is very much well on track as of first of January. I'm more than happy to explain more what it means in practice if there are questions about this. But uh, it is a very, very big revolution for our bank, for our group, because uh, we should also come the European Investment Fund. Uh, but uh, the investment needs are absolutely huge. Even before the COVID crisis, it was estimated that in the EU we need 60, uh, sorry, 650 billion per year to invest in climate, uh, uh, in climate adaptation and um, uh, and uh, different uh, aspects of fighting the, the climate emergency. And this is this means uh, that, of course, uh, no public money can be sufficient here. And globally, it is uh, the amount is estimated at two two uh, two trillion per year. Um, I would say uh, here the uh, the question which uh, which is absolutely vital is that it's not just on how you actually mobilize financing for the different projects, but actually how you build the the uh, sustainable finance markets. EIB has been a pioneer in this with green bonds and so on. Of course, now the union will be a big player in this with uh, with the next generation uh, Europe um, um, funding program, where they, where a lot of this will be funded through green uh, green, green bonds. Second point, uh, I'm sorry, it, I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm too slow, but I will speed up. My second point is innovation and digitalization. Uh, ICT accounts for 20% or around 20% of um, uh, R&D investments in the EU while in China and the US it's 50%. We have been lagging behind already for 15 years with ICT investments. And if you look at, if you survey companies as we do in the European Union, you see two things. First of all, they know they need to adapt. And this is very much, very, very, very visible. On the other hand, many of them are not able to adapt because they lack funds uh, to adapt. So I would simply say that the big priority in the coming years, certainly for the EIB, a uh, group will be to build up the uh, resilience of our economy um, uh, and uh, the future of our economy by investing in uh, digitalization. And here, let me just say that 
uh, if you look at the data for the, for example, for artificial intelligence, um, uh, fastest growing uh, companies, on the list of 100 of those companies globally, only five of them are European and not among the largest 50 uh, companies on, the, on that list. So uh, here, uh, I would say my point number two is targeting the, the startups. Uh, my third point is simply to say that uh, we have to avoid cliff edge scenarios in the economic recovery. The economic recovery may have different shapes uh, attributed often to different letters, V, uh, K, whatever. Uh, but what is very important is, uh, I mentioned this already, there will be winners and losers. Um, but uh, the new normal, uh, we should help the company, the corporate sector in Europe to adapt to the new normal. And here you need a, a lot of predictability and also public steer. So I don't think that the next generation Europe that would last for three years or any program that is designed for two or three years can be sufficient. Frankly, I think we will probably need a longer time perspective and you will need institutions like the EAB group, but also a national public, uh, national development banks. Uh, uh, and uh, and all those actors who can mobilize uh, also private investment. My final point is about uh, geopolitical aspects. Obviously, we are all very much uh, hopeful for, for the new start for multilateralism and transatlantic cooperation with the new American president. However, uh, the crisis has, uh, has changed a lot in geopolitics. It's not a place for me now to, to talk about this. But uh, I think that what we really have to take uh, as a lesson from this is we have to be much more uh, visible and effective on the ground. We have to program our activities better uh, in development policy. Uh, this is linked, of course, to climate, but it's also linked to digitalization. It is linked to all the opportunities for global economy and for us as well. Uh, of course, the EIB has played a very big role in the recent months. We have provided healthcare and uh, business resilience to over 100 countries uh, globally in recent months, uh, different packages for the Western Balkans, for 10 African countries, uh, partnership with uh, WHO and so on. Uh, but I think a lot more will be needed and uh, we are very much looking forward to working closely with the Commission, the EAS uh, and other actors on the national level in the European Union, of course with regional development banks such as EBRD, Council of Europe Bank and others, to be able to build up a, um, a better cooperation in able to foster our geopolitical interests and also to deliver better on the development needs in the new context. Thank you very much. And let me just say maybe, so if you ask me in a nutshell, what is the added value of the EIB? I would say, well, first of all, this is basically to provide support to the short-term crisis needs uh, to support uh, medium-term recovery and uh, also to uh, foster the EU strategy for the longer term. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Mikoy, for this uh, for this impressive overview of um, areas in which the EIB is um, uh, is involved. Um, Klaus Vela will have to leave uh, momentarily, and I would still like to come back to him with a couple of questions uh, that have been uh, asked uh, from the audience. Um, and let me maybe bring those uh, uh, together. I hope uh, Klaus is still with us. I think he is. Um, so there has been a question which related to the fact that uh, the risks you spoke about have been known for years, uh, but the EU has not always acted upon them. So uh, can the EU now get its act together and genuinely build the capacity to react? Uh, that was one question. There was also a question about the differences of views across the member states, and I think we we are um, um, completely aware of the fact that um, different member states uh, have a different take on the risks uh, um, associated uh, with uh, the, the, the situation today. So how do we overcome those? Um, and there was also a question, uh, can we do this under the existing treaties? Well, I wanted to spare the last one for you because uh, it can surely lead to, to a lengthy discussion. So what would be your take, Klaus, about today's level of preparedness? Uh, I mean, is the current, is the current shock uh, that we are going through sufficient to, to move us to a different level in terms of preparedness? Mm -hmm. I would say the following. Um, we have a very intensive debate, not only in EU institutions, but also in the member states, uh, about uh, what is being called autonomy and sovereignty on the European Union level. Different people pr prefer different wordings. 
Um, but if that is the level of ambition, and um, these words have been used by the President of the Commission, by the President of the European Council, surely also in the European Parliament, then in order in, to play in that league, uh, you need a comprehensive risk assessment. You need to analyze your strengths and weaknesses. And if you have serious weaknesses which can uh, come to the open, uh, you have to address them. So if that is the level of ambition, the rest is the consequence. And uh, I believe that um, diff different views which might be existing between different actors, politicians, but also member states, could be narrowed by, a kind, by work on a kind of joint risk mapping. Uh, because if you speak uh, facts first, uh, these things are discussable. Do we really believe that this is the major risk or is it a little bit smaller risk? So I think uh, um, a dialogue, a conversation about what are these generalized risks and how likely are there, maybe also involving um, uh, strategic planners in the member states, uh, the, the people dealing with those in the European institutions, I think that could bring us a very long way forward. And I'm also uh, a great believer of first exploring the possibilities within existing treaties, because a bit far too often, um, people are saying this is not covered by the treaties and that's why we can't do nothing. And normally it's not true. Uh, normally, this is more an issue of political will. There might be absolute boundaries, uh, but we have seen that when the necessity was there, we normally found solutions. So I don't think we should jump out of this debate and escape from this debate by believing or saying that the treaties don't allow us. I think there are many, many things we can do, and those things need to be done if uh, the ambition that has been laid out both by the President of the Commission and by the President of the European Council, if this ambition has to be taken for real. Klaus, thank you very much uh, for these uh, ideas, uh, in particular uh, the one on the joint uh, risk mapping, which uh, which we will surely take away from, from this uh, discussion. And, and thank you for being with us uh, uh, today. I, I know we have to leave for another uh, engagement. Let me now uh, welcome and turn to uh, Pascal Lardini, Deputy Secretary General uh, and Chief Operating Officer of the European Commission, uh, where he's in charge of institutional and uh, administrative uh, policies. And I would like to ask um, Pascal about resilience in uh, the day-to-day -day Commission practice. Um, uh, the, the foresight report uh, that uh, Vice President uh, Shevchevich spoke about um, tells us that um, foresight will be an integral part of the better regulation toolbox. Um, and it also speaks about setting up prototype resilience dashboards uh, to monitor resilience. Uh, so has the practice um, of uh, policy elaboration at the Commission changed uh, already to, to reflect uh, this prerogative uh, of resilience and what are you planning to do in order to, to meet that goal? Uh, Pascal. Thank you, Pavel, and good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, indeed, I mean, I would like to, to make three sets of comments. One is to explain what the Commission has done since a year on foresight. The second is to say a few words on, on the foresight report. And the third is to explain what the dashboards are. So indeed, I mean, uh, when the president uh, came uh, a year ago in the commission, she tasked the vice president with the function of looking at foresight. And in fact, we had uh, clearly a, a capacity of foresight uh, studies uh, and exploration in the commission, but it was sort of uh, separate for the, from the mainstream political agenda setting. And the idea was to bring it much closer to the daily work of the services and of the college. Uh, it's why now it's part of the activities of the Secretariat General to oversee the different uh, foresight capacities that we have across the house. I mean, certain DGs who, who, who are working for many years on sort of uh, front uh, technologies had developed this foresight capacity. But what we have now trying, tried to do is to uh, uh, inject foresight capacities across the Commission services and to structure, to mainstream and structure this foresight capacity at the service of policy setting. So it's maybe no longer foresight for foresight, 
but for fight for policy policy making. And very concretely, now we try also to inject the foresight dimension to the impact assessment and evaluation of our existing pieces of legislation to look a bit beyond the normal sort of uh, perimeter of, of, of studies that we were accustomed to, to see what are the longer trends, longer tra trends uh, in Europe and across the world. We had a very interesting discussion recently with the German presidency on sandboxes legislation. So uh, areas where you can test legislation with the help of, uh, of industry, of social partners and so on in, in, in frontline technologies, for instance. So the, the, this longer term tendency uh, is very important for a, a daily uh, legislative work. So that's what we have done since a year. Uh, and we try also to reach out to the member states, and I will come back to that. The second, I would like to say a few words about the strategic, the first ever strategic foresight report produced by the Commission on the 9th of, of September. You've seen we define uh, resilience as a central theme of this uh, first uh, strategic report, and we want to give it a positive uh, connotation. Resilience is also the possibility to absorb shock, to react to shocks, but also to transform. This transformative capacity of resilience is very important and also in relation to uh, the agenda setting that I've just mentioned. It's very important that resilience uh, percolates across all policy area because we are actually faced with a health crisis which has multi-dimension and it is quite paradoxical in the sense that we are faced with a number of urgencies and the need for longer term perspective, longer term thinking and foresight has never been so, so high in a sense. We are reflecting today about the future of our health system, the future of our social security system, the new way of working, the new normal as, as we call it, green jobs, digital transition, the, the twin transition that we have uh, mentioned several times. So this long-term uh, vision should uh, highlight or enlighten actually the making and the preparation of all the policy initiatives that the Commission is uh, preparing. And for that, we are uh, using the different techniques that, that Foresight uh, put, at, put, put at our disposal, like uh, megatrends, uh, horizon scanning, reference scenario, and future proofing of policy, policy making. So, um, as you've uh, explained, uh, Pavel, uh, the first foresight report uh, goes across four dimensions of resilience, socio-economic, geopolitical, green and digital. And you see immediately the link between that and the political priorities that uh, President van der Leyen and her, and her college have put forward. So this is intimately uh, intertwined. Now, I think I would finish my first uh, introductory remarks by talking about the dashboards, because this is really innovative and I think the audience of this conference should understand what they are and what they are not. They are presented as really prototypes. They are part of this uh, first annual report on, on foresight uh, on page 36. And it's a, a way of representing, of positioning the member states against a number of indicators on their capacity of resilience. It was, of course, a choice made by the Commission to select 2022 20, indicators and to rank based on the information we have the member states but this is not some kind of uh, top of the class ranking it's just to highlight the the strengths and weaknesses of one member state at a particular moment it's a photography um, on, on on poverty on number of uh, high emergency beds on, on, on a number of indicators and actually, we were very positively surprised by the reaction of the member states in the Council. There, there was no animosity at all. On the contrary, because we have also made the necessary precaution that this is not a ranking. This is just something which will uh, continue to evolve over time. And actually, we are currently refining uh, these uh, dashboards in view of engaging with the member states. I don't know whether uh, Vice President has mentioned the idea that we would like to have a permanent network, network with uh, uh, ministers in the member states, what we call the ministers of the future, actually those who could engage on these longer term trends and have a discussion, a conversation 
in the Council about these trends. That would be my introductory statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. If I can uh, come back to you with an immediate question, because um, I'm, I'm very curious um, how uh, intense these discussions um, around resilience have been already. I mean, these are early days, of course, and you are only uh, you know, putting in place uh, the structures uh, to do this. Uh, but what you would consider resilience might not be the same as what I would consider resilience. So how uh, how contested uh, this this term you think might be in the future? I mean, it, does it have the potential to to bring us uh, together, or or rather to uh, to create also some some very sensitive uh, issues among uh, the member states? Uh, the joint uh, mapping of the risks. Uh, that Klaus Bella uh, mentioned. Is that is that the exercise that can bring the union closer together, or is it an exercise that will that will create uh, inevitably tensions? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, in a sense, the the crisis helps because all member states are faced with the same uh, challenges. And I think I would agree with Klaus on this point that we need to start with this risk mapping that we can probably do together. I mean uh, the. There are facts uh, which are unescapable uh, that we are living through being on the health situation, being on, on climate, also being on a number of, of, of big tickets, political priorities, where the risk mapping can be done together. Now, where probably we would disagree is the actual solutions to, to these problems that we should identify in common. But I think that what we are trying now to bring into uh, our uh, daily work, as I've mentioned, impact assessment and evaluations to have this longer term trend that nobody can dispute in a sense. And then uh, choosing the right solution is, 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 is purely political in a sense. Thank you so much, uh, Pascal. Um, I know we have been joined by um, uh, Benedetta Berti, Head of Policy Planning at NATO. However, I would like to bring in um, a couple of questions uh, uh, which are addressed to, to Mikowai from, uh, from the floor. So one question has to do with the fact that the Foresight Report says that 85% of economic growth will be generated outside of the Union. Now, in what you said, Mikawa, you, you outlined the, the huge investment needs uh, in Europe. So the question is, how can we create a situation where investment and growth will indeed happen in Europe? So that's one question. And there is also an interesting question about technology and, and AI, uh, namely, should the EU be investing in an EU sovereign cloud solution? Um, I'll be happy for any of the speakers to take uh, the latter one. But maybe on the first one, Mikawa, if you could share your thoughts. Well, thank you. This is, of course, a very interesting question. Uh, there's uh, many dimensions to it. Uh, so I will try to go one level up from, uh, from my, uh, let's say, introductory statement, and I will try to, to mention a few more political elements. First of all, uh, well, there is one element which came up in the interview of uh, Maro Szewczewicz before our panel, where he mentioned the labor, uh, the skilled force in Europe, that we certainly need more of skilled force. And this is certainly going to be a very big problem uh, coming with the, the democratic uh, situation in Europe, where basically we need uh, to be to have a, a flexible labor market, which, uh, which would provide uh, us with opportunities to, uh, for the labor force to, uh, to get more skills and also to, be, uh, to adjust uh, as necessary to the different challenges, including technological challenges. Uh, second element is, of course, we are a regulatory superpower, but we are not a technological superpower. So I think uh, what uh, what we need is certainly to make sure that at least what are our assets, we should make sure that we use them to the best possible way. And here I would especially mention not just the single market, but also specifically the uh, the capital um, uh, uh, capital markets union and uh, and the and the missing elements of the banking union where basically we need to make sure that our financial system which is going to be sufficiently weakened uh, also by events such as brexit in the coming weeks um, uh, is going to become more resilient i mean this is not new and this is an old story you, you may have heard this before that um, in the us uh, a, a large part i think it's 80 percent of funding for innovative companies comes from uh, venture capital in europe this is about 10 percent maybe 15 percent uh, this has to change we cannot just rely on public finance and we need to mobilize 
private finance. But to do that, we need to have the the one capital markets union. We need to have the uh, the one market. And uh, there is, of course, also uh, one other aspect, which uh, which is uh, which is simply uh, the fact that. Uh, we are not uh, leaders, uh, neither in technology, for example, in clean technology. We are not. Uh, we are not very much uh, able to compete already in a number of sectors with, for example, with, well, with the Chinese and the Americans. So I think we also have to decide what are our specializations, and this has to be done at European level. Uh, so a certain degree of planning uh, will certainly be very much uh, needed. And this is not so much about vague concepts as we've been discussing for decades, industrial policy of the European Union, but it has to be very concrete and also coming with investment strategies. And the EIB, is very, the EIB group is very much interested to have this type of guidance because we are those as this largest multi, uh, multinational financier of, uh, of uh, climate policy, of innovation and so on. We can certainly help, but uh, this has to be a, a uniform action. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mikoai, for 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 this feedback, which is extremely useful. Uh, as I said, I would now like to uh, welcome uh, Benedetta Berti, head of uh, policy planning at the Office of Secretary General of NATO. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. If I understand correctly, straight from the the session of the NAC. Um, now at NATO, you have uh, had a thorough experience, of course, with putting resilience at the heart of. Uh, common defense, and this covers a wide range of uh, issues from cyberspace, one of the most uh, extreme areas of uh, vulnerability, onto hybrid threats uh, and civil and military um, readiness. So can resilience offer guidance uh, to NATO strategy? And if so, um, how? Benedetta Berti. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here straight from the NAC. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me just start by saying that I think this is really an important question and one that we are very much looking at as we look at the next 10 years of our alliance as part of the Secretary General's NATO 2030 process. And of course, uh, you're completely right. Resilience is uh, national resilience. The resilience of our allies is the first line of our common defense, of our collective defense. And for NATO, this is not something, of course, for NATO looking at resilience and how to best support allies in their own national resilience is not a new um, it's not a new function because, of course, our allies commit as part of their commitment to the Washington Treaty, to Article 3, to develop individually and collectively their capacity for self-defense, and that as resilience to its very core. Uh, to me, you are correct that when we look at our future strategy, we need to put resilience at the front and center. Just, uh, just as important as we think about our defense and deterrence, we need to talk about resilience as the key enabler of our defense and deterrence. I think this is true for many reasons. Maybe um, some that come to mind uh, that I think are important is first of all, because if you actually look at our military efforts, they depend uh, very, very substantially on our, on, the, on our civilian infrastructure being sound at the digital and physical level. I think, for example, large military operations to transport military equipment for large military operations, this relies, within our alliance, relies 90% on civilian infrastructure. Trains, uh, aircraft, ships. So, of course, we need to have uh, resilient uh, ports, roads, digital infrastructure, but also fuel, water delivery. Otherwise, our militaries cannot operate. So to us, this is very key to our, to, to our strategic success. It's, I think if you look at the future, resilience also needs to be front and center because the, the lines between the, the civil and the military are increasingly more blurred. Certainly our adversary are using civil and military tools to try to undermine us. And so our response needs to be also comprehensive and integrated. Uh, I also think that our militaries are really as strong as our societies are. And that's a way to think about resilience, not just in the narrow military sense, but much more as part of a discussion about resilient citizens, resilient societies, democratic resilience. Ultimately, all of these are structurally uh, and foundationally key to our ability to have strong militaries. 
Uh, also, I think that for NATO, uh, continuing to work on this will remain essential because to me, this is an essentially transatlantic issue. If our security and our defense are interconnected, as they are, and also our economies are interconnected, then it follows logically that we should not have two different approaches. Otherwise, how do we work together? So we need to continue to work together through NATO, bringing North America and Europe together so that we can have a common approach to resilience. So I think we're already doing a lot. Uh, NATO's role has been that of, first of all, of setting minimum common standards in key areas that we think are crucial for our resilience. There are seven areas, and they include energy supplies, transportation, food and water, telecommunications, including 5G, uh, as well as um, continuity of government and government services. And this includes, for example, health the health equipment and uh, and health systems. So all of this gives us a basis to, to consult, to work together, to have shared assessments of the state of our critical infrastructure. And on that basis, to identify what are the risks, what are the vulnerabilities, and how do we we, how do we address them? And just in October, at the last defense ministerial, allies had an opportunity to really uh, have a discussion around this issue. And uh, one of the things we're looking forward in 2021 is a strength and resilience pledge, where we will, where we hope that there will be uh, some very substantial step forward in what we do, and how, and also how we define resilience. And uh, one last, uh, one last uh, point in my five, in my brief five minutes is that I think that when I look at the future, which is very much what this conference is about, uh, I think that there's a lot of room for NATO and EU to work together on these issues. And one of the questions that to me will continue will become more and more central is how do we really expand how we look at resilience, and how do we look at critical assets. Uh, critical infrastructure, critical technologies, and their impact, and, and their impact on our collective security and defense. I think that requires, for example, having conversation about uh, who owns, who, are, where is, who owns our critical infrastructure, who owns our critical uh, technologies, where are foreign direct investment in our critical infrastructure coming from, uh, and what does that mean for our common security? I think that's a conversation that we should definitely have. Uh, how do we make sure that we have secure and safe supply chains? and that we are able to draw from them whenever there is a crisis, being the pandemic or being any type of other security crisis. And perhaps we can even think about uh, how do we, in a world in which economics, geoeconomics and geopolitics are more and more intertwined, uh, then resilience maybe is also about thinking about what do we export and to who and how. And these are all questions that I think, uh, if I look at the next 10 years and I think about a vision, uh, for the for the future of our security discussion on resilience, uh, these are very much questions on my mind, and I stop here. Benedetta, thank you uh, very much. It's clear that uh, that NATO is an experienced uh, actor in the field of building uh, resilience, no doubt about it. But uh, when you were when you were listing the areas that you consider critical, um, it's uh, it's obvious as well that uh, many of them are not within the uh, the sphere of competence of NATO. So my immediate uh, question will be, how do you work uh, together with uh, other organizations and the EU in particular on these uh, questions? And I would want to ask uh, also Pascal a similar question uh, with regards to how uh, the Commission plans to, to take this up uh, with uh, with NATO. But Benedetta, maybe you could give us your take first. Surely. And uh, I think the way the, the way we work as uh, the way we work on these issues as NATO is that allies have agreed uh, as part of the resilience pledge to to continue to work towards meeting these common standards on all these areas. So of course they do that they do so nationally. This is a national competence. But the role of NATO has been to help provide a common set of minimum standards. And what we're saying and what allies have agreed uh, for us to do is to say, if we want to be interoperable, if we want to work together as effective as possible, if we want to have a strong collective defense, then we need to have a common minimum common denominator when it comes to how resilience our fuel supply is, our transport system is, our military, our um, telecommunication infrastructure is, because if not, 
we can't really uh, fulfill our mission. So in that sense, it is very much a core competency for us to make sure that if we need to operate together, we're able to do so. So that's how that's how we're doing it. And of course, as part of that exercise, there's common there's common discussions about what are our risks, what are the vulnerabilities, and then how each Alex moves forward individually to implement those. Um, but at the same time, I think you're absolutely correct. This, this is an area where we do and we want to work with other international organizations. The European Union is very uh, is of course a strategic partner for NATO, and there's already er there's already areas of cooperation on this. And for example, you mentioned hybrid and uh, on on, on countering hybrid threats, NATO and EU cooperation is and has continued to advance. There is, of course, the uh, Center of Excellence on Hybrid Threat in Helsinki that allows us to, to have a platform also to exchange experiences and, and, to, and to share approaches and to build convergence, which I think is very important. And then, of course, there are areas in which we are, I would say, mutually reinforcing. An example is military mobility, of course, because NATO, we need to have, uh, we need to be able to have a safe and sound and resilience infrastructure. We need our military equipment to be able to move in order for our deterrence to be credible. So that's clearly a NATO interest. We clearly have a role to set the standards, but then we need to work with others. And here is a good example of partnership with the European Union to then take that forward. And to me, this is very much a model that we should apply in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benedetta. This is uh, really an impressive approach. And I would like to go to, to Pascal, uh, not only with a question that I mentioned earlier, namely, how is the Commission working with, uh, with other uh, organizations and institutions? Um, but what Benedetta mentioned, the, uh, the minimum common standards in, uh, in seven areas, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that surely uh, is um, an approach uh, that also uh, the EU must be uh, must be looking at um, how to define this minimum common standards of uh, of, of resilience. Uh, Pascal, can you throw some light on these issues? Yes, thank you. Uh, clearly, I see that uh, of course uh, the allies within the within the framework of NATO can define their minimum standards. But uh, as far as the uh, EU member states who are also part of NATO, some of these issues are are, are dealt with at at EU level. Uh, in, in all the sectors where there is EU competence. And I think I would insist on one point uh, that the new commission has, has done since uh, its arrival is a completely new approach to industrial uh, policy, uh, bringing into it uh, really this uh, risk assessment and longer term vision. I mean, as you know, we have developed this approach uh, of um, ecosystems. We have identified 14 ecosystems and rather than looking at sector after sector it's really all the sector all sort of the service providers or the product providers which are necessary to make one ecosystem live and it's why also now this discussion about strategic autonomy or sovereignty is so pregnant because we have been highlighting in these ecosystems what what are sort of the the areas where we should concentrate first our attention to ensure this autonomic, uh, this strategic autonomy. I mean, I can mention a few. Uh, today, the Commission has put forward a strategy on pharmaceuticals, which precisely addresses this issue that we have discovered during the crisis, that even for some basic pharmaceuticals, we had lost uh, the, not the manufacturing capacity, but the capacity to decide for our own future how many million doses we needed in how many days. So I think this is sort of reflection, and it's very uh, emblematic, this, this discussion on, on pharmaceuticals, but there are many others on 5G, on, on, on a number of, of these things. You mentioned the European cloud is a very, very vivid example. I think I'm personally persuaded that we need to invest in a European cloud, even more probably after the cancellation of the uh, privacy shield by the Court of Justice. We need to have a uh, our own destiny in, 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 in hand. So I think this sort of strategic reflection based on risks and ecosystems is the way to go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. Uh, we have to leave it there, but there is a question that I, st I uh, at least want to quote, uh, if, not, uh, if not answer, unfortunately, because we, we are running out of time. So resilience is power, um, the question says, how to apply internally and externally this new form of 
power to the European Union's global uh, role. I think this is an excellent way of putting it. Uh, let me um, make three very brief uh, conclusions. Uh, first of all, uh, the term of resilience has seen almost a Jupiterian rise in the in the past uh, few few months. Uh, but resilience is with us to stay. Uh, in fact, uh, one could say that we are in an era of uh, resilience. Uh, secondly, I, I believe from what we have discussed, the EU is particularly well positioned to be an actor in this space because many of the ingredients of resilience needs to materialize at the EU level. Uh, and thirdly, resilience is a European public good, uh, but it cannot just remain part of the narrative. It has to be seen as guiding political choices, public discourse, and executive decisions. And I think we've, uh, we've seen quite a few examples of how this is done uh, already. Uh, so this has to, resilience has to live up to its promise, so to say. Uh, let me thank our excellent speakers today, um, Klaus Bella, Mikhailov Gilevich, Pascal Lardini, and uh, Benedetta uh, Berti. Uh, please stay tuned for the next uh, panel, uh, which is on understanding the new big picture. How has coronavirus changed our thinking about key global trends? And I'll have the pleasure of handing over the moderation of that panel to Christian Leffler, the former Deputy Secretary General of the External Action Service, and that panel will begin at five o'clock sharp, which means in four minutes. Thank you very much for your attention and huge thanks to the panelists. <laughs>